Are you sitting comfortably? Then it's time to soar. This is the riff chord. Everyone having a great day? Getting ready to soar? Because here we go. Canada is famous for its comedy actors, many of whom trained and honed their craft on Toronto's Second City stage. Today, our special guest is the Second City Artistic Director, Kevin Frank. You'll recognize him as an improv comedy actor, writer, TV actor, all around great guy. Let's welcome Kevin. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Paul. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I scrambled around to find the, the neatest uh, background I could in my crazy household. So uh, here we are. <laughs> it looks great. It looks great. We're glad, glad to have you. Now let's kick off because my experience has been any discussion that gets into Second City starts talking about the Second City alumni. The discussion is eventually going there. So you've been involved in Second City for many decades now, have you? Yeah, actually uh, celebrating 35 years with the organization. Good for you. Well done. So I've got family and friends in the U.S. who are going to watch this. Let's, let's impress them and let them know what types of uh, actors' names come out of Second City. Well, let's specifically talk about Toronto first because sure. we have been creating amazing artists that have excelled in film and television, not only in front of the camera but behind the camera. So we talk about uh, Canadian alumni. Uh, right now, currently, Lauren Ash on Superstore is a Toronto uh, alumni who eventually went to the Chicago uh, cast and put up some shows there. She's an incredible writer and performer, great comic timing. Uh, was in a very dramatic theater school that was just not her jam. She quit theater school and went right over to Second City to train. And in a really short period of time, she was on our main stage. So she is really a superstar and will continue to be throughout her career. Of course, on that same cast is Mark McKinney from the Kids in the Hall, who did spend some time on our stages. So, uh, also an alumni. And of course, the famous improviser, Colin Mockery, came out of Toronto, still lives in Toronto, in Leaside, with his lovely wife, Deb McGrath, who's also a Second City alumni. Colin Mockery uh, is, a, is a Second City guy. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, he was in the same cast with uh, uh, Ryan Stiles. Mm. Uh, because Ryan Stiles, originally from Washington, Mm -hmm. joined the Second City family for Expo 86. We had a cast that was permanently uh, located on that site. And mm -hmm. it was uh, Colin and Gary Jones, who uh, later became a star of Stargate. He was the scientist on Stargate for 10 seasons. Mm -hmm. Still a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, so Ryan, Colin, uh, Jonesy, Pat McKenna, was also uh, a star in that cast and here in London and Toronto and still a very good friend of mine and a member of my comedy troupe, The Yes Men. Oh, so um, we're still performing, uh, doing some, some old guy shows around town, having a, having a blast. So those are just some of the names. Of course, obviously, Gilda Radner, who was here in Toronto doing Godspell in 1972 and was scooped up by Andrew Alexander uh, along with Eugene Levy mm -hmm. and Martin Short. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were all, they joined the original cast, Dan Aykroyd, um, John Candy. These are all people that came out of Toronto uh, over the years. Of course, Mike Myers uh, started as a kid who loved Second City, grew up in Scarborough. Uh, he and I were roommates on the road when we were both in the tour company. Uh, so uh, it, here was this old guy joining uh, the comedy troupe with this 19-year-old phenom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who was just destined to be a star. That was his every thought, was to yeah. become a star. And, and of course he did uh, several times over. Uh, Catherine O'Hara still knocking out of the park and getting all sorts of accolades all yeah. these years later, yeah. uh, was an understudy for Gilda um, and, and was working the box office and went into the cast when uh, Gilda couldn't do a show. Yeah. It could be because she knew it uh, mm -hmm. uh, from front to back, having seen it so much. Yeah. Uh, and, and never left the cast. Really, really quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrea Martin, uh, Dave Thomas, who was friends of uh, uh, Ben Gordon, a uh, very famous uh, writer, producer, director, comic. They were both copywriters in advertising. Oh. They hadn't improvised before, but Ben was so 
quick. And he says, hey, my pal, a uh, copywriter, he's really funny. So he brought Dave Thomas over. <coughs> Pardon me. Still got that, that cough that went around. Yeah. And those two guys were killing it on the stage wow. um, early on. Uh, and then later, obviously, uh, Dave Thomas went over to SCTV. Yeah. Uh, even if we talk about people like uh, Tony Rosato, an amazing talent, yeah. born in Italy. Uh, and to this day, the, the, he was the first ever SNL cast member to have been born outside the USA. Uh, and so he was uh, Italian first and then became a Canadian citizen and then went on to great fame, sadly, uh, left us far too soon. But what a talent. And I will say that uh, as a kid in high school, we did a class trip to Second City at the old fire hall on Lombard Avenue. And uh, the cast that I saw was uh, Jane Eastwood. Um, ben Gordon, Tony Rosato, um, and it was this amazing epiphany. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, my buddy was next to me, a good friend of mine, who I still see to this day. Yeah. Uh, he gave me a little elbow and he said, you could do that. Uh, yeah. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you could do that. You do that every day. Yeah. And uh, it didn't dawn on me. And then uh, about, about 12 years later, yeah. Uh, he was in the audience when I had my opening night on that very stage. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 So it was quite fun. And uh, what year would that have been? That would have been early 80s, maybe? Yeah, 1984 is when I uh, joined the Second City Casts. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, in their professional cast both in London, Ontario, where we had a beautiful little corner stage for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I was in the London main stage, the Toronto main stage, and the touring company for a couple of years. And then I moved on to television and film. Fantastic. And I started teaching almost immediately, 1988. And I've oh, been teaching yeah. at Second City um, ever since. So it's right. been a while. And, and today you're the artistic director and you run the school on the Toronto stage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I run it with a huge ensemble of really talented arts administrators and creative people. Uh, yeah. We all work on it together. But yes, I'm the artistic director of the training center, uh, soon to retire. So oh, we have a long search for uh, the next AD. We found her. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll work side by side for about a calendar year, mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll just veer off and do some specialty programming and uh, uh, corporate facilitation, that kind of stuff. Yeah, fascinating. That's great. Yeah. Now, that's a, that's a great 35 years you've had in the industry and with the theater. You must have seen changes over that period, or you must have seen comedy styles come and go and the way people, the way the audiences react. Maybe you could talk about a little bit of that. Well, of course, when I joined the organization, we had the, the fire hall. It was a tiny little space. We crammed 200 people in there. <coughs> Pardon me. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was a, the corner stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it was tiny. Mm -hmm. And when Andrew had dreams of expanding the program, because he had so much success with mm -hmm. uh, SCTV and the Toronto uh, stages, that um, he turned around and he bought the entire company. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, it's owned by a Canadian family. Uh, mm -hmm. Second City uh, International. So when we moved to uh, Blue Jays Way, and we yep. had 56 Blue Jays Way, it was a 400-seat theater with a massive stage, mm -hmm. and uh, it was ready for television as well. It was, it was created to uh, shoot live TV on it. We had to adjust our shows almost immediately. Yep. That transplanted show, the last one that was uh, in the fire hall, was called Last Tango on Lombard, I see. We moved it over to the new theater and it did not play well because it was an intimate show mm -hmm. with small action and, and intimate stories. And we realized we needed to uh, meet with the times if we were going to be in the theater de uh, department or theater uh, district in Toronto and uh, really expand the skills. So our cast members changed. We looked for people who had more theatrical skills, singing, dancing, uh, big performers who could reach out and hit that back wall in a bigger space. And that changed the content that we were creating. The process has never changed. That has been our signature for us since December 16th, 1959, when we did our first show in Chicago. Uh, the process is to improvise to create content and to re-improvise to edit and right. often in front of a live audience. Right. Uh, and so that has always remained our, our uh, rock, our foundation is that process that makes it very unique. Uh, however, the, the content that we create 
scenes are shorter. Uh, sometimes some of the classic scenes that I look at in the archive material are 12 minutes long. Oh my God, if someone pitched a 12 minute scene today, they'd be drummed out of the cast. Right. Uh, three minutes, three and a half, five, if you've got a great you know, punch ending. Uh, it, it's tight and fast and yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, since we opened, the internet became a big thing. Twitter came around. Mm -hmm. um, we also experienced um, uh, uh, 24-hour news. Mm -hmm. And so the news cycle and the reach of information is massive. So our mm -hmm. audience is well-informed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so if we're talking uh, uh, with authority about a topic, we better rewrite because yeah, yeah. someone in the audience knows exactly all the details. Exactly. Yeah, no, I've really uh, enjoyed some shows over the years at Second City. And, and to see it live, there is an energy in the room that you don't get on television. And it really kind of takes you away. It's, um, it's amazing. And I, I remember a couple sketches that really stuck with me. I, I know you've seen... You notice, I just, you noticed the plug here. I just... Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, you've seen hundreds and thousands of sketches over the years. But there was one where the storyline was that the guy had gone to a dance club and um, the background actors were doing the house music and they were going, bom, 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 wow. But then when he gets in the cab to go home, like the music is still ringing in his ears. So they're mm -hmm. right up on his face going, bom, 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 wow. And then when he's trying to sleep at home, he's got his head on the pillow and the, they're right over top of him on the pillow going, bom, bom, bom. <laughs> And then, and then, and then he's peeing and they're like, bom, bom. And, and then one guy gets like kneeling down. So like he's at his belt line saying it like right into his belt, like, bom, bom. Oh, I, the energy in the room, like we were just cracking up so hard. Yeah. And what the, the beautiful thing about something that, that is such a simple idea, uh, we've all experienced it. We've been to a loud concert or a club and the, and our ears are ringing long afterwards. No, and exactly. that was the simple pitch for that premise. It's just like, what about a scene where you just can't get away from the, the loud music, uh, you know, even when you lay down to sleep that night? And the audience will laugh because it's the truth. And that's where we find the greatest humor is in the truth. And I'll say, oh, my gosh, I've been that person. I've been there laying there. And the booming is still in my head at, in bed. And, and then just the staging of it is just a clever approach to presenting the truth. No, exactly. exactly. And then another time, um, it wasn't the, the, the main troupe. There's a traveling troupe as well. Is that right? Mm -hmm. and they were performing at the uh, Witchwood Art Barns in Toronto. And the energy that they brought to the stage was uh, really great. And I was laughing so hard. And um, the, the storyline that they were, it was that people were bragging to their friends about something that had happened, like a story. Uh, then they acted out the story. But then they, then the the cast could act out what it really happened and one guy's story was that you know he was in line for a club and the bouncer was this huge guy and i told the i just told the bouncer step off and people were like you said that yeah i did and the guy was scared right and then they show what really happened and it was a it was a hostess who was a teenage girl and she was like slapping him down saying get out get out <laughs> oh my goodness yes i remember that so clearly <clears throat> that was written or at least proposed yeah. uh, by jason de ross who uh, uh, went on to be on our main stage and create some great content, as yeah. well as yeah. um, uh, the head of the writing program here and really inspired a lot of next generation comedy writers. He, he had that original premise uh, cool. because he was, uh, he was a short stature like myself and always being you know, ribbed by his castmates. And yeah. so he just <laughs> keep that up so well. This is really fun. I remember that performance specifically. Yeah, and uh, one thing from that, like I was in the audience cracking up, I actually turned and I caught your face. Now it was only a glimpse, but you had your hockey coach face on, like you were studying seriously. And I always wondered whether as the artistic director there, do you laugh or are you study? Cause I've heard Lauren Michaels laughs a little bit, but not, not a lot. He's in business mode. Uh, well, when you're on the clock, which is yeah. difficult to turn off when you're on the clock, you are looking at timing, volume, energy, sure. punch, uh, you're thinking, is that the best blow line to end the scene? Uh, right. Yeah, you're always doing that. And most of the time I go, oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Instead of laughing, uh, yeah. because I'm thinking about uh, that was the tilt I was thinking about or, yeah. or that was the, the flip ending, uh, the reverse, uh, all of that sort of stuff. It's like, ah, nicely done. You yeah, know, exactly. so you're exactly. sort of analyzing it. Yeah. So now your own experience on stage, you know, what, what type of comedic actor are you? What, what type of skills did you bring to your? <laughs> so. uh, I'm a very physical comic. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I really express how I'm feeling or how I'm reacting to something uh, with my full body. Uh, I've always been really comfortable like that growing up, being a huge fan of Chaplin and Buster Keaton, oh, uh, Tim Conway, uh, Jerry Lewis to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, I really admired how they could tell a story without words, more of an international comic approach. Yeah. So that's been my style. Uh, and currently I'm working with Pat McKenna, uh, who many people will rem remember from the Red Green Show and Traders, oh, yeah. a very talented actor, writer, very funny and a genuine human being. And Neil Crone, who's been on so many shows over the years as a character actor and You'll see him in an upcoming episode of Nurses, uh, which is a new global television show. Um, he, the three of us are a troop, and we just love to surprise each other. We love to challenge each other with, uh, we may go out onto a show, and it's a 90-minute show, with absolutely no idea what we're going to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So that on the fly, we will decide what the next improvisational performance game should be based on what the audience is giving us back. Incredible. Go for 90 minutes. Yeah. Now yeah. that takes years of experience, I would imagine, to get to the point where you can trust in yourself and trust in the process that we're yeah, going to have good show. It's a 10,000 hours thing. It, you know, you've, you've spent 10,000 hours on stage. You get a sense of this is halfway through the show. The audience might be getting a little tired. Let's take this down to a low energy and then we'll ramp it up like a roller coaster to the end. So we right. get the sense. Yeah. Now I, I did an improv class once uh, simply because it was a corporate thing. I was working the place I worked. They said, well, for something different for training, let's do the improv class. And we yeah. were down at, I guess it was the Blue Jays way space mm -hmm. in the back there. And uh, Lee was the guy's name. Lee, a big guy. I can't, you know who it is. Um, Lee Smart. Lee Smart. Exactly. Oh no. Is that, is that a guy or is that a woman? Is it it's a, a man. Yeah. Okay. It was at Lee and, um, Anyways, um, I felt like in the exercises, I probably came out of the gate trying too hard. And I'm sure that's a very common um, approach that most beginners bring. What Less is more. Is, Less yeah. is more, right? And a long look at your scene partner will yield far more positive results than a quick response. Because the audience is filling in the, the silence with what they would say, and they're laughing. Because right. they're all imagining that you're going to say what they're going to say. Right. Yeah. You just wait for it. Yeah. Because I kind of thought, well, I'll throw something crazy at my partner. And a lot of times they were, they didn't know what to do with it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so yeah, as you say, probably less is more, just play it cool. Right? Yeah. And uh, one of our great uh, instructors and uh, uh, founders of North American style improv, Keith Johnstone, mm -hmm. who's a professor of English and theater at the university of Calgary. Uh, all, I've been to a number of his, of his workshops over the years. He's 85 years old now, but he's, he taught one a couple of years ago. And his advice is be boring. Be ordinary. Really? Do exactly what everyone is expecting you to do, mm -hmm. and it will be marvelous. Yeah. And he's right. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Now, in every group of friends or every workplace, there's one crazy guy. <laughs> and everyone says, oh, you should do the second, you, could, you should do the second city training. Um, you probably get students through that are that person. Do they make good improv actors or is that, is, are they a diamond in the rough? They need to be polished or what's the, uh, you know, we uh, have 1100 students come through our doors every week to take mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. We've got 70 teachers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they come through our doors every 10 minutes oh, saying my friends say I'm pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so I'd like to take a class and get onto your main stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, we say, absolutely, sign up here. And, um, you know, for the next 10 years, we'll get you there. Yeah. And it, that's usually quite a shock. Uh, <laughs> and and, and the, the smart ones will listen. They'll mm -hmm. listen and practice. Uh, the ones who just only have their eyes on being superstars will get in their own way too much. Is it's an right? ensemble uh, art form. You are only there to take care of your scene partner. They're going to take care of you. So if you're focused on you getting the laugh, you will not survive very long in sketch comedy or improv. Right. Oh, that, that's really interesting. Because I just, Conan O'Brien was on Howard Stern and Howard said, were you the class clown? He says, everyone asked me that. The answer is no. The class clown didn't really have the stamina of what it took, right? Uh, yeah. And the discipline to really get into it and build a career out of it. They were impulsive and they could do, right? 
crazy stuff, but this is a long game here and you got to work at this craft. Oh, absolutely. Um, and you've got to know who's holding the purse strings. Uh, they're the ones that you satisfy, uh, not yourself. You just go along for the ride. <clears throat> to give you an example. Um, there was a span in my career that I had something on television every day for 20 years, something commercial, a guest spot on television, industrial show, something was on the air every day mm -hmm. for 20 years. Yeah. I never watched any of it. Really? Yeah. I never, I was not interested in seeing it. I'd already done it. Mm -hmm. I can't change it. Mm -hmm. If I watch too much of it, I'll try to overcorrect the next time I'm performing because I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. My idea was if they liked it and they're continuing to hire me, then I'm fine. Oh, right? That's good. Take direction. They hire me, they pay me, they bring me back. Don't change anything. Yeah. You know, grow with confidence, add to your tool set, but don't watch your own stuff because you're just going to make changes that people don't want. Oh, that's fascinating. It just, yeah. in preparing for this podcast, I was looking at your IMDb page and you've done a lot over the years, including some Hollywood movies. Um, well, I, there is one on there that isn't mine. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, because the there's another Kevin Frank. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, that there was another Kevin Frank, and oh. they mixed it up and they put it on there. I wrote them to say that wasn't me. Yeah, uh, but they are slow to make those changes. So. Oh, okay. And but there was I've actually seen you on the screen in a in a spot that wasn't on the list, and it was a short film. It may have performed at the Toronto International Film Festival called The Moon Palace. Yes. Where yeah, where um, the storyline was a young guy is a writer, needs to get a job. He goes to a Chinese restaurant. They, he goes, do you need a writer here? They say, yeah, the job is you, there's microphones under every table. You listen to their conversations, and then you write the fortune in the fortune cookie. That right. will keep them coming back. And one of the tables is a, a mob boss speaking to his mafia soldiers. And then I see you, you were either the boss or one of the soldiers. I can't recall, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I sat in Chinatown here in Toronto. Um, it was quite fun. I think I worked a total of 30 minutes, uh, very low budget. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I had completely forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, that was, that was fun. We had a lot of time. Yeah, it was improv. It, oh, that's great. And, <laughs> uh, and they had a bunch of improvisers around the table. So they just said, well, just have a conversation. Get into trouble. <laughs> that's good. That's good. And yeah. one of the things from that film that I always remember is that the, um, the, the kid always asks the owner questions. Quite often the answer is because I'm in the restaurant business. Yes. <laughs> Why do you listen to these conversations? And because I'm in the restaurant business. And at one time he says to him, uh, Mr. Chin or whatever his name is, I noticed that when you speak to a customer, you sound like you're a new immigrant. But when you're speaking to us, you've clearly been in Canada for a long time. And his answer is, it's because I'm in the restaurant business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a clever script. I really, I really enjoyed uh, when I read that. I thought, oh, I would have loved to have a bigger part in this film because it was yeah. Uh, yeah. quite clever. I also had a small role <coughs> in, a, in a Jack Lemmon film, and I thought, oh, I'm going to meet Jack Lemmon. And I never did. I never had a scene with him. He was never on set when I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did have a scene with Dan Aykroyd, who happened to be his new son-in-law, uh, who uh, suspected that there was a murderer yeah, in, yeah. The, in the family. Yeah. And so we did, a, we did a scene at a garden party, and there was a bunch of us having a conversation. Nice. And uh, this is one of my most embarrassing moments on set. Uh, another actor who was uh, uh, an emerging artist like all of us, but at the same time, he was a financial investor uh, full time. Oh, I see. And in between takes, yeah. he took out his business card and gave it to Dan Aykroyd. He says, um, you know, if uh, no one's handling your investments, I would love to uh, really grow your portfolio. And he hands them a card. And the... I mean, it was outdoors, but still all the air disappeared when he did this because we thought, this is the height of inappropriateness. And Dan Aykroyd, he was so graceful about it. He said, uh, oh, that's lovely. My brother-in-law is a, um, a financial uh, uh, advisor as well. And if I ever took it outside the family, I'd never be able to go to Thanksgiving dinner again. Oh, that's cute. And so it was the end of it, right? Yeah, yeah. So he was so graceful about it. But oh my gosh, I never saw that actor on camera. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the word got out. It's like, don't ever put him on set. It was so inappropriate. Yeah. He disappeared. Yeah, during a working session on set. He went up to the principal actor and said, right? I tried to yeah, drum him up as a client. With us, like he was there in the scene. And then in between takes, 
he puts on his financial advisor hat. It was like, oh my God, it was so embarrassing. Oh. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn towards the, uh, the finish line here. Um, <laughs> Kevin, what is uh, the one thing that uh, nobody ever asks you, but they probably should? Um, uh, I guess uh, if I still enjoy performing. Okay. And do yeah. you still enjoy performing? Um, funny you should ask. It, it, absolutely. Absolutely. Every time I step on stage, either with emerging artists uh, in our school and I, I jump into a student show or with my peers who are head and shoulders more talented than I am, I enjoy every minute on that stage because that laughter I know is something that everyone in the, uh, in the audience is enjoying for their own reasons. Yeah. But I was able to touch their lives and bring laughter into it. And I think that's so immensely powerful yeah. that I'll never get tired of that. That's, that's amazing. I've, I've never experienced that. I, I watch all the comedians on their podcast and they talk about that energy. And uh, Billy Crystal did, did a beautiful one man show that uh, 700 Sundays. Mm -hmm. when, he, when he came to Toronto, he spent some time chatting with the audience. If you know, I've worked at Massey Hall over the years, but he, he, could see, he, he goes, I can still hear the laughs. And you could see how much that, that memory stuck with him, right? Oh, absolutely. That's why I enjoy the live theater far more than doing television and film. Right. Nobody laughs, even though they think it's funny because they don't want to ruin the take. Yeah. And uh, you don't get that immediate energy that you can play with. But that live, that could be 10 people in the audience. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, everyone, that's been Kevin Frank. He's the artistic director at uh, Second City in Toronto, a very long uh, 30 plus year career in uh, comedy acting. Thank you, Kevin. And people can see you at, uh, does Yes Men have a website? Uh, yes, we do. Yes Men, uh, yes Men Improv, uh, .ca is our website. Yeah. <clears throat> you can also check out my rock and roll band, Glendale One. We have a Facebook page. Um, it's a bunch of old guys like me playing Lennon and McCartney songs that we have reimagined in the genres of the heroes they were listening to when they wrote their music. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So we do a full on uh, 90 minute show of number one hits uh, performed like you've never heard it. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I look forward to seeing that. Yeah. Glendale One. Okay. We have a YouTube channel. Check us out. I, Glendale One. And is, is it the number one or the word one? It's the word one. Okay, Glendale One. Which was our phone numbers. We all grew up in Brampton, and I was Glendale One, 6356. Ah, fantastic. Okay, good to see you. All the best. Thanks, Paul. Take care. I love that discussion, and I hope you did too. I'm really honored that Kevin did that. I'm just looking at his website, uh, yesmenimprov.com. Uh, pretty impressive. He's on stage uh, performing with Pat McKenna. Uh, CBC TV viewers will recognize Pat as uh, one of the cast members of The Red Green Show, as well as Neil Crone, and you'll recognize Neil Crone, a long, long-time Canadian actor, and had a recurring role on Little Mosque on the Prairie, so just some great guys doing some great uh, performance art. Really pleased with this podcast. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for joining us, and thank you, everyone, for listening. All the best, everyone. Everyone.